This is volleyball, the world's second most popular sport. And this is professional volleyball. People were very skeptical about the league. And all of a sudden, they saw it. And they went, wow, these people hit the ball hard. These women can play. Feels really good when you get underneath the spike driven very hard. Let's do something different. It have never been tried. It's a product that you just got to get people in to see. Once they see it, we filled our house. Barry Gordy was really a fan. He would bring all the Motown performers to the matches. Look at these guys are interested. How great is this going to be? We had some big crowds when Wilt showed up. Oh, Wilt Chamberlain. <laughs> I really love the sport. The sport has a lot of things that basketball had for me. For the finals, we had 8,000 people in San Diego watching a game of volleyball. In the United States, that had never happened before. The party was an important aspect of it. It was the 70s. Come on, cocaine was a big thing. An arena in Denver, I don't know if they had free beer night or not, but... <laughs> the owners in Denver were big volleyball fans. The original information we had was that they were bringing in truckloads of uh, marijuana up to eight, 900 pound quantities at a time. That was a considerable amount of marijuana. The sports world is tough. And I think the IBA was maybe before its time. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Oh, yes, we did. Yes, we did, friends. How are you? My name is Tim Hanlon, and uh, this is, of course, Good Seats Still Available, our curious little podcast that uh, is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Uh, thank you for joining the proceedings. Uh, we appreciate you finding us uh, in uh, the, the wide swath of stuff out there in podcast land. And uh, for finding us and downloading us and putting us into your earbuds, we uh, we greatly appreciate it. And uh, we are uh, sticking into the 70s uh, once again this week, uh, as we are wont to do, not because necessarily we, uh, you know, have any uh, tremendous uh, love uh, for that decade, although a hell of a lot of interesting things happened uh, during it, especially in the realm of sports and especially in the realm of, of teams and leagues no longer with us. Uh, and we're going to go back to a topic that we haven't talked about in, geez, almost three years now. Uh, if you go back to the uh, uh, spin the way back dial to uh, our episode number nine back in April of 2017, when we were just kind of getting our sea legs uh, with this show, we had a, a tremendous conversation with uh, documentary filmmaker Mike Jacobs. And we talked about at the time uh, his 30 for 30 uh, ESPN short called Bump and Spike, uh, the story, the curious story of this thing called the International Volleyball Association. Uh, that clip you just heard was the promo for that movie. And um, while it's been uh, difficult to find, ESPN's been a little uh, parsimonious in uh, in uh, releasing it and uh, keeping it out there. Uh, it is well worth the find. Uh, it is an amazing film about a curious, a fascinatingly curious league uh, that was around for a handful of years uh, and kind of, you know, got through some fits and starts in the, the late 70s, 1975 to 1980. Uh, in particular, and uh, was the uh, uh, a noble attempt at co-ed professional volleyball uh, in the United States. And uh, our guest this week uh, was very much in the midst and perhaps one of the greatest players of that league during its brief time on the American sports scene. His name is Jay Hanseth. You heard his name in the uh, in the clip there a couple of times, not his name, his voice, of course. Uh, and uh, he is uh, prominently featured uh, in this movie. And again, it's called Bump and Spike. Uh, it was uh, an ESPN 30 for 30 film. It is it is available out there. We're going to try to figure out specifically the easiest and, and fastest way that our listeners can uh, can get it. But uh, I, I assure you that this episode, as well as our episode uh, number nine with Mike Jacobs, are well worth uh, listening to prior to finding that video. You will enjoy uh, the uh, the hijinks, shall we say, that uh, that our guest Jay Hanseth has for us this week. Crazy is not uh, even the right, uh, I think, adjective to describe this league. It was co-ed, so that that was interesting uh, in and of itself. It uh, was in the middle of the uh, 1970s, which itself was a decade of excess. And and I think the league uh, kind of exhibited a bunch of those excesses. Uh, you had uh, star-studded uh, investors in people like Barry Diller, 
media mogul he and Barry Gordy of Motown fame and all his roster of Motown stars who are also minority investors uh, in this league and some of these uh, in some of these teams. You had standout uh, talent uh, in the forms of, uh, you know, uh, U.S. volleyball players and and beach volleyball players like Jay Hanseth uh, and a bunch of his uh, colleagues, as well as uh, players from other sports, in particular, a guy named Wilt Chamberlain, who you might remember from uh, his uh, basketball and, shall we say, other exploits. Uh, but he was a big fan of volleyball. And matter of fact, uh, used uh, volleyball very much in uh, his rehab efforts when uh, he uh, found injuries in uh, in his playing days during the uh, his days playing in the NBA. He found volleyball to be a very uh, therapeutic sport and oh, maybe even a, a, a way to, you know, kind of stay fresh with the ladies, if you will, on the beaches of Southern California. We're getting in all of that uh, and much, much more. Chris, crazy stories. Uh, you had uh, two, two owners in the uh, the Denver Comets franchise that were basically using the team as a front for drugs. Some argue whether that uh, they're being uh, caught in the in at halftime, by the way, of a De- Denver Comets game. If that was the actual demise of the IVA, uh, some would argue it was kind of already starting to uh, to crumble a bit. Uh, but uh, let's put it this way: this kind of publicity, uh, this arrest, uh, literally in the middle of the uh, of a professional volleyball game, uh, probably didn't help uh, in terms of uh, of public relations for the then fledgling International Volleyball Association. But you eagle eyed uh, viewers and and uh, memory keepers of the 1970s, if you remember watching. Uh, the superstars on ABC. Well, you actually may remember some of the stars of the IVA actually uh, doing well in that competition and trying to bring, you know, some uh, public relations goodness to that league. Uh, we get into uh, uh, into some of that as well as uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, CBS uh, even broadcast. It might have been a playoff game and, and certainly one of the uh, all star games. I know the one that uh, I think it was in 1976 when Will Chamberlain was playing, too. So uh, some really interesting uh, stories around this International Volleyball Association and on the periphery for certain of uh, of pro sports. But uh, it was it was quite something. And if you lived in places like uh, Tucson or or Santa Barbara or San Diego or, uh, you know, even Phoenix or Denver or Seattle, the Seattle Smashers or the San Jose Diablos during the last season of its existence, the last year of the league's existence, all those places, a lot on the West Coast and the Southwest, you probably remember uh, with more than just a glint in your eye, the International Volleyball Association. And we're going to get into some of the uh, really intriguing stories of that league with our guest, Jay Hanseth, coming up in just a moment or two. Uh, and perhaps one of the best ways to uh, to commemorate the uh, International Volleyball Association is by heading over to one of our great sponsors, SportsHistoryCollectibles.com where you can uh, you you'd go into the uh, other sports section and you will see uh, sitting there very nicely and very beautifully a Los Angeles Stars 1976 IVA volleyball program the Los Angeles Stars were uh, uh, one of the more uh, intriguing teams uh, in the league's history uh, and if you if you look at uh, some of the uh, photography there of this volleyball program uh, at sportshistorycollectibles.com uh, you'll see that even in the uh, uh, the features that uh, show all the players and their photos and a little biography about them, you'll see just underneath their photos, true to the star's name, uh, their horoscope signs, uh, which I thought was pretty neat. But, you know, whatever it takes to kind of get attention and uh, to market the hell out of uh, a fledgling sport team and league as the stars and the IVA were and was, were and was, you know what I mean, uh, you can find this uh, great program. Uh, as well as a whole ton of other great sports memorabilia, well photographed and uh, and nicely priced and well lit. It's certainly not uh, the, uh, the the more speculative world of eBay, eBay and those other places at sportshistorycollectibles.com. And our pal Dean Mitchell and his friends in San Diego who run said site, we've they and we've got a promo code for you there. Uh, at the site, and you you can use that for fifteen percent off all of your purchases, and that's good seats, all one word, good seats. That's the promo code at sportshistorycollectibles.com, where you can get not only the Los Angeles Stars nineteen seventy six International Volleyball Association program, but a whole ton of other things from all kinds of leagues and teams that you may just have uh, just forgotten 
Uh, they're all there for you, and it's a, it's a great array, and there's new stuff arriving just about every week. Once again, sportshistorycollectibles.com, and use the promo code GOODSEATS for 15% off all of your purchases. And we thank Dean and his friends at uh, at the site at sportshistorycollectibles.com for their sponsorship. And uh, we uh, thank you, of course, for continuing to listen as we now segue into our fun and jovial and uh, hard-to-believe conversation with the uh, International Volleyball Association's star player from uh, back in the 70s, back in the day. Here he is, our conversation with Jay Hansen, coming up right at you. So the IVA has has been fascinating to me because I grew up as a kid uh, fascinated by this thing called the North American Soccer League. So I grew up in the New York area, the NASL, you may remember the LA Aztecs back in the day. I grew up as a Cosmos fan and and I I became fascinated as a kid by all these teams that sort of came and went. And it um, just kind of morphed into sort of an obsession. And it's it's odd because it's it seems to be like a, an obsession for a lot of different people, and I think it's rooted in a lot of it seems to be kind of male, some more uh, childhood related, uh, and just you know general sports uh, intrigue and, and interest. And the IVA to me, you know, I was fascinated, uh, you know, when this was. Uh, kind of came into documentary form. It's one of those leagues, like the '70s, right? Was a a very furtive and and fertile time of uh, a change and and challenge to the establishment of sports. And there were a lot of challenger leagues and and sports and that. But the IVA, well, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it though, the the ones that made it were the ones that were alive and functioning when ESPN twenty four hour sports started going and we missed that by a couple of years. I mean, you know, ESPN 24 hours a day sports, they're looking for content. And, um, like we were the, the ABP and the IVA, all that, they, we were happening, um, prior to that. And the, the beach volleyball transitioned through it a little bit. And we had MTV following us. We had, you know, some a lot more television than the IVA had. The IVA was banking on the Olympics as sort of a springboard, and then Jimmy Carter, of course, canceled it, um, which hurt. So a, lo- a lot of it was, I think, if we had made it until the the broadcasting of ESPN, the the league stood a good chance of making it. You know, and then Jimmy Carter's economy was, you know, eighteen percent interest rates, so financing a league in that atmosphere financially was pretty tough. Well, it's also it's also ironic that um, uh, that the Mike Jacobs uh, uh, documentary, part of the 30 for 30 uh, film series, uh, uh, Bump and Spike, which, by the way, is, is challenging to find. And, and I, I'm sure it's a, a bit concerning to, to, to Mike as well. Uh, because it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating, and and some of the the video that does is part of it is is great. And you're actually uh, a, a quite the I don't know what it is about the players in that league, but uh, all of you seem to have held up exceedingly well as the age as the as the years have piled on. But it's ironic that it was on ESPN, right? And and you're getting to some some of the points. So it, was this league essentially ahead of its time? It sounds like it could have been especially given that cable television and sports wasn't really sort of a burgeoning thing yet. Well, I, I think it really was because um, the one of the big selling points of the league was bringing the women in because uh, volleyball in, in co- high school and college is the number one women's sport. So you have the huge following of women and, and, and they designed the whole format to allow women to be on the court because they didn't have to play at the net. They could play behind. And so prior to all this me too stuff, all this women's rights stuff, the league recognized, Hey, there's a huge market. When these women finish playing high school and college volleyball, there's nothing for them to watch. There's nothing for them to be interested in other than uh, high school or college volleyball. So it was a big thing. And we, the men, the men players, you know, we were giving up Olympic aspirations because if we turned pro, we couldn't play amateur. So there's a big concern for us 
was this going to be some stupid format with these the, where the women going to be able to play in a, in a much more powerful setting than they were used to and we were concerned giving up our amateur status in order to play in this league because initially the salaries weren't that high a few of the premier players would get the bulk of the money and the rest of it were the the players were kind of their salaries were filled in and they were like eight or ten thousand dollars the first couple of years so when it came about and the women really did a surprisingly great job they adjusted to the increased velocity of the play and the power of the play and uh, a lot of the starting women in the league were really international stars but mainly on defense and passing they didn't they, they didn't need to hit or block other than Mary Jo Pepler I want to get into uh, sort of how you got into the sport in the first place in a second but let, let me just ask you further on that that point right so in some respects too there's also I'm guessing frankly a bit of a marketing element the fact that it's co-ed right uh, the sort of proverbial sex appeal sells kind of thing and it's also as unique because I think uh, I guess world team tennis was also you know, somewhat fledgling at the time, too, which is kind of the only other at the time sort of major sport that was also flirting with this idea of how to integrate males and females simultaneously into the action versus other sports in this country. Well, the advantage we had as volleyball is most of the women players were very feminine and really attractive. Um, the We weren't trying to draw out the six foot three really powerful women. We were trying to get the really agile and quick and good passers and defenders. So they tended to be, have great figures and, um, you know, and quite you, and usually they came from the beach situation. So they were used to being in a bathing suit. They usually had, you know, they grew up going down to the beach. If they didn't feel good in the bathing suit, they didn't usually play beach volleyball. So the the pool of players we drew from were a lot of them beach volleyball players originally, which transitioned into indoor game, and then they got drafted in our league. So the the women were quite attractive, which was and feminine. So it was a it was a good mix for marketing, you know, because then the uh, the it was attractive for the men fans and the women fans in the regard that they were watching Females play it in a professional level. Well, I, and and you see that, right? If you look in the, in the sort of a, uh, in the archives and stuff, you p- see people like Linda Fernandez, for example, a, a very talented player. Uh, you know, arguably was sort of the Yang to to Wilt Chamberlain, for example's Yin. We'll get to that in a, in a little later. But you know, uh, she's featured in People Magazine, for God's sakes, right? And 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 has had had or or was sort of had some dalliances in modeling, and and could have been perhaps if she weren't sort of a, pr- a professional volleyball player. Uh, beyond her you know, she was athletic and uh, plus the superstars exposure, right? Which I'm sure is a television experience, right? N- again, it's television, right? It's a little bit of, you know, not good, good, attractive uh, promotion for, for a fledgling league. Yeah. Well, well, the superstars was, I mean, Mary Jo's the one that was like brought attention to uh, the female volleyball athlete. I mean, she was like so powerful and she was like so far beyond those other women that were in the superstars competition. You know, she was six foot, six foot one and like 170 pounds. And it was, it was, I remember that superstars competition on television. They had the softball throw and she was a track star too. And she, the other uh, girls are all throwing it out there like 50 yards or something. She threw it the length of the football field. I mean, she threw it. She was like unbelievable arm strength. I mean, she just got up there. <laughs> <laughs> through it, through it so far, it was like automatic win. Nobody even else tried. So, I mean, she was an unbelievable athlete, kind of a prototype of modern female athletes. All right. Well, let, let, I will come back to that. But I, I really let, let me start with the origin story for you, though, because I, I'm, I just want to get a sense of uh, and I think our audience, too, is is how how you and frankly, maybe representative of other players as well. I think you're hinting at it. So you're kind of a, a creature of the Southern California beach volleyball culture right and from an amateur kind of starting point i maybe a little bit of background and maybe maybe it's representative of some of the the other players that were part of this iva about sort of how you well a lot of a lot of us were really high school and college basketball players a lot of us um basketball is a very easy sport to transition into volleyball a lot of the skills that 
the same. The the body, uh, your build is because if you're good at basketball, you're going to be conducive to playing volleyball also. So most a lot of us were basketball players that uh, and we went to school on coastal uh, high schools and colleges and in the off season, we would go down and play volleyball. Me, for instance, I was playing basketball and I would go to the beach down in Santa Monica and I, I would be down by the water playing poker or doing something with my friends. And I'd look up and there's all these guys playing beach volleyball. So it's just like, Hmm, that's interesting. And then I just gradually started going, Hmm, I think I could play that. And then it's just, you start playing it on the outer courts where all the rookies and people that are just learning play and the, the top players have a certain court that nobody touches unless they're there playing. So you work your way up, you know, you work your way up. You're, you're, you're as big, you're as strong. You just haven't played as much as these older guys. And, you know, we're, we're all good athletes. And a lot of the guys in the IBA uh, were basketball players and, and uh, we transition that way down at the beach watching those guys and then you know suddenly we're not practicing basketball in the off season we're playing beach volleyball all the time and then the next thing you know we're not even playing basketball anymore we're playing volleyball so that became a lifestyle the beach volleyball was really a lifestyle sport you were sort of in in the 70s the guys that were playing in the in the beach volleyball tournaments it was lifestyle it was like they went to the beach every day most of them had evening jobs waiting or doing something that allowed them to play volleyball. It was, it was not like recreational. It was your life. Well, and you were, you were playing in college too. And were your were other players kind of sort of doing that as well? I mean, it seems like it was kind of, you said lifestyle for sure. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Greg Lee played UCLA basketball. I played basketball at UC Santa Barbara. Tom Shamalis, who was one of the very, very top beach volleyball players and played in the IBA. He played junior college basketball and then gave it up, gave basketball up for volleyball. John Valley played, Keith Erickson played uh, volleyball on the beach. So there were just numerous, numerous uh, players that I, I, I can't even list that just transitioned into playing beach volleyball. So I grew up in Pacific Palisades and, you know, it was, it was the hotbed of volleyball for high schools. And then I just, when I wasn't playing basketball, I'd go in the other gym and play volleyball. So when I went, started going to the beach, I was going, I kind of play a little bit of volleyball. I think I could go up there and play. And then the next thing you know, you, if you're a good basketball athlete and you play enough volleyball, you're going to be good. What what is it? What was it about sort of the lifestyle though, uh, the uh, the sport and the lifestyle? I mean, you know, uh, social. Uh, I mean, what, what what was it that kind of attracted you to kind of tilt full time towards it? It was it was total lifestyle. You went to the beach. They, most of the people that were either at these hotbed beach volleyball uh, locations, like I said, their work accommodated volleyball. It wasn't the other way around. Volleyball was the first priority. You fit your work program around it so you could go um, to the beach. Um, it was a social setting. There were parties and there would be old time volleyball players that were 70 years old at these parties. There were drunk draw tournaments where we would fill trash cans full of liquor. And we would, if you won, it was, it would be a tournament and you'd play round Robin. And if you won, you had to take two, you had to drink a full cup of this liquor. If you lost, you only had to take a half. So the better players as they kept winning would get more drunk than the lower players. So it all evened out at the end. And it was just stuff like that. There was just, you became friends and it was a closed circle. It, it, like at these beaches there, the, it would be a crew of socially, intertwined people and it was almost like a club and it, it was sort of closed off unless you were a volleyball player like it would be very hard for new people to come down unless they were a volleyball player you didn't just come down and start sitting there and, and day after day and you would kind of get ostracized if you weren't a volleyball player and it was it was you know we'd go to these tournaments and the main 
there would be the guys that won the tournament or finished very high were very serious about it. The other people that finished fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, whatever on the tournament, they were more, these tournaments would happen throughout California on the beaches, Santa Cruz, Manhattan Beach, San Diego, whatever. And the more important thing was the parties that would be involved. So everybody would drive up in their Volkswagen van. You'd, you'd play as best you could, but the main thing is Friday and Saturday night, there would be parties. The lower ranked players were usually hung over. And in addition to that, the fans were also, it was, it was more than just fans. They were part of the crew. Maybe they weren't the good players, but they went to your beach and they would travel to these tournaments. If it was in Santa Cruz, they would all be up there. We would all be at the same party. We would all be doing the same thing. And the, um, sometimes they would enter the tournaments themselves. They would be intermediate recreational players. But these tournaments were so big that you could enter it. You could play against your – it'd be like entering a, a, a three-on-three basketball tournament and Michael Jordan's there and you're like a high school guy or you're a, a recreation B player or something and you got to play the first round against him. And so it was like really exciting for these these players that were just intermediate ability in the first round of the tournament, they could enter the tournament and they could play against the lowest seed would play the top seed. So you would be playing against the best player in the world on the beach. And it was really exciting. And so it, it drew more than just the serious players. It drew the kids that wanted to play against their idol, they'd, there'd be 15 and 14 year olds entering the tournament because you'd have 120 teams. Typically today, it's a totally different thing. It's strictly professional, but back then, you know, that's 200, 120 teams, that's 250 people about. So you could just have friends of friends that wanted to play against the top player and they'd enter the tournament. So you had this full, Wherever the tournament was, you had this roving group of core lifestyle beach bums that were also volleyball players. And it, it, we, we really were beach bums. And once you had to start working, then you transitioned out of it. You know, once you, oh, I'm 29, I'm 30, I got to get a real job. And then suddenly you kind of leave it. All right, but some guys never left it. Yeah, well, but it's uh, okay. But it also sounds like for the elite players, uh, it also sounds like it was quite a bit of a fertile ground for uh, recruitment, either for college or for the Olympic kind of path, or knock on wood, this uh, this fledgling uh, professional thing called the IVA. But maybe maybe in lockstep, we can sort of get to that. Like, is am I correct in assuming that there were, shall we say, scouts finding? Some of the better talent. No, these no, not from the not from not from the beach. The beach was not conducive to Olympic style volleyball. It was usually collegiate, but a lot of the beach players were also collegiate players. But if you were strictly a sand beach volleyball player, it didn't translate into uh, playing uh, in the pro league. It had a different set of skills, a different ball, and it, it required more physicality. So most of the most of the guys that ended up in this pro league were either uh, national team indoor players or they were co co collegiate players or ex collegiate players that were now playing on the beach, but that had indoor experience. You had to have indoor experience to play. Otherwise the, the skill set didn't translate. See, I, I played collegiate volleyball and beach volleyball. And most of the guys did that. I played basketball, but when basketball season was over, I would play on the volleyball team at UCSB. And same thing, Chris Marlowe, who's the announcer for the uh, for the Denver NBA team, he also did that. He played it. He was an All American at San Diego State indoor volleyball, but he was also a beach volleyball player. So you had to have. It was mainly you had to have collegiate experience. And then the older guys were were still competing on the national team in the Olympics and the Pan Am Games and things like that. So that was the that was the draw. And then the other the other pool of players that came to the IVA were the international players that had played. They were U.S. was really not very good at volleyball relative to the international game 
um, because um, it had no government backing. So the 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 uh, Eastern Bloc countries, Russia, Yugoslavia, all these countries, they had government financing for the for their Olympic sports. So we drew from the the players that were just retiring from their national team and they were the, the top players in the world, but they were like in the l- early thirties, they weren't going to be able to play in the next Olympics because by then they'd be 36 or seven. There were new guys coming up. So they, we got a lot of guys from Poland, from Brazil, from whatever. And they were the best in the world, but they were, they were getting rewarded for their time on the, their national teams by allowing them to play for money on our, you know, cause we were the only, only place you could play and make money. So how do you get ensnared into this then? Like, so how do you, how do you find out what, when do you discover this thing, this fledgling thing called the IVA and, and what, uh, and what's the path by which you get involved? Okay. I'm, I'm a beach volleyball player in the summers, a basketball player the rest of the time I'm in college and during the summer, uh, one of the older guys who was the volleyball coach at UCSB asked me to play in one of the beach tournaments. He was a former Olympic player and very famous guy, Rudy Sawara, which you probably want to talk to also. But he, uh, he, um, he asked me to play, and he was a very famous guy, very indoor mainly, but on the beach also. And we ended up winning the tournament somehow. I was only 20 years old or 19 years old and he was coach at UCSB. So I was on a, I was finishing up junior college basketball and I had some scholarship offers, but not from UCSB. Well, he talked the UCSB basketball coach into giving me a scholarship for basketball. So I could also play volleyball because he wanted, he thought I was really good at volleyball. So he thought, oh, I'll get this kid to be able to come that he'll play basketball and volleyball. So I got up there and then I played both sports and I played under him. He ended up being quitting the UCSB coaching of volleyball and became the coach of the first IVA team in San Diego. So he was Barry Gordy recruited him to be the coach of his new team in San Diego. And that, and I had just graduated. I had no more college eligibility. So he hired me as one of his players. So that's how I got into it. So the San Diego Breakers, which was owned by Barry Gordy of Motown fame, uh, essentially through the coach basically found you. And were there others uh, that uh, the Tasmanian devil uh, was also looking for uh, in you know, yeah, I mean, he knew all he knew all the players he wanted. He, they were all friends of his or acquaintances of his. He he knew. It's a very it's a very small circle of people that that were that could play at that level in the United States. There's probably I don't know 50 people that 60 people that were really capable of playing and that were still active and in shape. Because usually the once you get out of college, you either play beach volleyball or you go into you start working you you know you don't so the guys that were freshly out of college were the best either the guys freshly out of college or the guys that were playing on the u.s national team that was your pool of players because they were in shape they were in good condition they were still competing and somebody that was out of the sport for five years they'd be fat and you know they would be out of it so he chose us and he chose other guys that were on the U.S. national team to play for his team so that it was it was he knew exactly who he wanted. He he had the best owner. It was David Wolper and him had the biggest checkbook. And so he got Barry Barry Gordy got the best team, Barry Gordy and Wolper. Well, so uh, let me let's, let's talk about them for a second, right? So Barry Gordy, obviously the founder of Motown Records, some we wouldn't mind uh, uh, delving into this escapade a bit more. Uh, David Walper, of course, uh, no longer with us, but a prolific, right? And that's maybe with a, an understatement, television producer, right? So uh, people like Barry Diller, of course, who was at the time at ABC and went on to Paramount and other sort of meagle, media mogulness. At some point, those names must have been a bit of an allure and maybe almost a sort of a confidence boost that this wasn't necessarily, at least initially, 
a not well thought out or fly by night kind of operation that this could be legit, right? Yeah, I mean, this was a situation um, when the when the league started. Um, there were you could you could either if you were an indoor player you could either quit and play out beach volleyball for no money, just a lifestyle thing, or you could try out for the U S national team. So that's all, there's only 12 slots there. And so if you wanted to play, if you wanted, if you had aspirations of, of playing, continuing to play, there wasn't much option. I mean, if you were offered a slot to try out for the pro league and you, you weren't playing national team, if you had no aspiration to play the Olympics, of course, the U S didn't have usually even qualify for the Olympics back in those days. So, and then Jimmy Carter canceled the 1980 Olympics, but that was later. Everybody that played in this league initially, it was either you were one of the top guys that they wanted. So then you made decent money. But if you were one of the fill in the, the middle of the roster type on down, you were just playing for the fun of it for a summer gig. Um, some of the people were teachers. Some of the people, uh, just had jobs and took a break. It was only three and a half, four months long. But the interesting thing was regarding Barry Gordy. This is a kind of a funny story. I was, it was the summer before this league started and I was down at the beach and Rudy Sawara, my coach got hired as the new coach of San Diego. So he's down at the beach and he says, and he tells me, oh, uh, the owner of our team is going to come down. He wants to see this volleyball scene and talk to a few people. So he might be coming down a little later. So a little later, down comes Barry Gordy, and he's got Marvin Gaye in tow. And Marvin's in this yellow fly velour jumpsuit, one-piece jumpsuit with gold chains all over and this big, huge sunglasses and this hat. And we're all sitting there going, Oh my God, that's Marvin Gaye, you know, and he's down there and he's a big guy and he's down there and he's like with Barry Gordy, I mean, at the beach, right. And they're in their little sandals and it's like only these black guys could, could pull off these outfits that are in, you know, this is a black guy going to the beach and this is, and they were like decked out in their, in their beach outfits and they came down there and they're talking to us and they're like, you know, uh, Rudy, my coach wanted me to be on the team and one other guy. And so he's like, it's going to be awesome. We got Barry Gordy's going to be our owner. We're going to play in the San Diego sports arena. And they were talking to us and they were really cool, really nice, very interested in the sport. Um, I don't know how interested they initially were because I think, um, the whole, how it all started was. Barry Gordy wanted to uh, get into the movies with Diana Ross in Lady Sings the Blue and Mahogany and all these things. And he approached Wolper as far to kind of uh, school him a little bit and help him with the, the process. He goes, I got this great black star. I got the music. I want to make a movie with starring her. I think they were married at the time. And so Wolper said, yeah, I can help you if you buy one of the teams of my new league. And so I think that's how it happened. He, Wolper was filming the night, the 76 Olympics in Mon I think it was either Montreal is in Canada. And he, and he fell in love with volleyball. He was filming all the secondary sports for one of his documentaries. And he loved volleyball. He went, Oh my God, this is the greatest thing. We'll start our own league. He was the Dodge Parker was a player and he, he wanted to form this league. He was like one of the original spearheads and uh, uh, kind of a, a, he coordinated between the players, the coaches and the owners. He would bring, he brought in most of the owners himself. He had a very dynamic personality, but Wolper was the one that loved the sport. And he, with his credibility and TV and all that behind him, uh, it, he, and then once he got Barry Gordy and then they, they were able to go, all these other owners kind of ponied up a little bit. The economy was good. Everything was good. You know, we were starting this new thing. We had Will Chamberlain. We had Barry Gordy. We had David Wolper. We had some, some, you know, some 
power behind us. You know, some we had, especially Wilt. Anywhere Wilt played, it'd be five thousand people without doing any promotion, just about. So anyway, that's that's how the the Barry Gordy thing kind of happened, and then it was fascinating because when we were playing, he would he had it was you know pro sports. You got your most pro sports. It's a, a lot of uh, black athletes and their white owners. Well, we were the white players and we had the black owners. So it was really, it was really kind of funny because they would come down and they had a gold roped off section of the sports arena that would seat about 50 people. And they came down in these limo caravans of about six limos. And he would bring all the Motown people down to San Diego from Hollywood, LA. They'd all come down like uh, Billy D. Williams, Diana Ross, Marvin Gaye, all these, all these people, every home game, every big home game. So we had the gold roped off section and they would come down in the limos down into the sports arena, drive right into the thing. And then they'd come in the locker room and we're sitting there going, Oh my God, what is this? Diana Ross is in here asking us about volleyball and our strategy. And, you know, it's, it was really bizarre. You know, it was like a total juxtaposition of normal sports. Well, what do you, what do you, they were really interested. Yeah. What do you think it was about that Wolper got interested in the first? I mean, he obviously, I think the 72 Olympics was kind of where he first got bitten by the bug in, in, uh, uh, in Germany. And then it just seemed to kind of, uh, you know, manifest from there. I'm, I guess I'm just really curious as to like why, why volleyball, which, you know, it's an amazingly interesting sport and it's a lot of fun to watch. There's no question. But well, I, th- also- I just think he, I think he thought it was going to be, he could format it to be a great televised sport. You know, he knew basketball, he knew football, he was looking at volleyball, he really was intrigued by it, and he thought he could, he could adapt it to uh, a televised sport. So, and that was it. And then putting the women on the court, that was just kind of a brainstorming thing, a marketing thing that they all came up with. See that's so so that's so that's especially interesting to me now as a player and we'll get into some of the 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 day to day and 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 some of the how you you know uh, went through the games and all that stuff in a second but um, I, I was reading uh, this little excerpt from his memoir uh, David Walper about him putting this league together and I guess around the time that you sort of got involved and, and became part of a part of the San Diego franchise and and uh, a one young uh, brash Peter Ubroth, uh was uh, sort of in his uh, inner circle and. Ubroth basically told him uh, all the various things that he thought that was go- wrong with this league, the way it was set up, the way it was structured, the way it was. Uh, and uh, basically at the time, Walper basically banished him from his office and said, OK, thanks a lot. But, you know, no thanks. And ironically, it came back in 84 when, you know, Ubroth was the head of the Olympic Committee and stuff. And Walper was instrumental actually in bringing Ubroth in to, to run uh, the Olympics, which is an interesting coda. But basically Walper recognized uh, after the fact that everything that Ubroth said uh, about the league wound up happening uh, to the, to the negative. Uh, but the interesting juxtaposition th- I think here is that, and I'm wondering if you have an answer to this given Walper's experience, right. And, and just, you know, mastery of the medium of television, how come the IVA never really kind of got and or on, you know, uh, exposed onto television? He was syndicating, you know, highlight shows for the NBA, for God's sakes, among many other things. I'm surprised that the IVA, besides a a little bit of a feature, you know, with Mary Jo Pe- Pepler, for example, on the, on the Superstars or the All-Star Game on CBS, you know, as a one-off, that it never really actually kind of got onto television in any way, shape or form. Well, we were relying on the Olympics for that because the three main cable, the three main networks, CBS, ABC, NBC, basically at that time, there was three main sports. There's football, basketball, baseball, and then minor sports like, you know, that they would do like boutique little. Yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, golf was there too. I mean, golf got a fair amount of stuff because of Nicholas and those guys tennis got a little bit but when there were major tournaments like Wimbledon or something but tennis didn't get much either there was you know when a perfect example I gave a I gave a I went to a sports luncheon in San Diego right and 
And I thought, I'm going to work on my public speaking. I was very shy and I thought, oh, I'm kind of pissed at myself. So I go down there and there's rodeo with the president Ford's son. And they got the rookie of the year, Carney Lansford. And then they got junior sale or they got some guy there. I don't know, some uh, charger football guy there. So they're all paying great attention while everybody's speaking. Then I get up to speak and they serve the food. <laughs> you know, nobody cared about minor sports in volleyball. They thought volley, the sports writers thought volleyball was something that, that like you did at the beach when there was nothing else to do. You'd bat it around and it's like Frisbee or something, you know, that was their concept of volleyball and they weren't interested in it. They grew up with, with, basketball, baseball, or football. And that's what they viewed sports. Everything else was like, yeah, maybe it's fun to watch it one time surfing, or maybe you, you watch skiing at the Olympics. Maybe you watch what at bicycling at the tour de France, but you know, week in week out, there was no sports channel. And until that happened and they, and these channels had to fill in 24 hours of sports, you, you didn't get enough of it. And if, if, if we in, I think in uh, 68, I don't even think we qualified for the Olympics. So we didn't have any, anything televised from Olympic volleyball. You know, let's see in 70, in 80, Jimmy Carter boycotted in 76, we didn't qualify for Montreal. So so you we, missed out. There was just two, no format. Yeah, you missed out on two sort of major springboards of promotion, if you will, right there, right? Yeah, I'm sure Wolper was planning on highlighting the 1980 Olympics. And then the economy tanked. I think the biggest thing was when interest rates were 18% or whatever, these business guys were just going, ah, I can't, I can't be paying, I can't be borrowing to, you know, to finance this league and this team is too expensive, you know? So I think that right when it folded, the economy was just the worst. So I, I'm, you know, the, we weren't going to the Olympics. Jimmy Carter notified everybody. Okay. We're boycotting the Olympics. The, the economy's tanking. Um, it just wasn't, we just missed out, you know, it was going, it, when, there was a time there where we, we were going quite well. We, you know, the, the attendance was good. It, the marketing was going well, but then when the owners started cutting back and like the product and started suffering, it just, the handwriting was on the wall. All right. What's this express VPN. Hey, you know, whether you're a supporter of the Red Devils or the Blues or the Hammers or the Gunners or perhaps like me, the Bournemouth Cherries. Hey, the easiest place to watch all of those games from the English Premier League uh, this season is with ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN allows you to access EPL streams from around the world for a fraction of the price it might normally cost. Here's how it works. Use ExpressVPN to buy an 11 sports account. ExpressVPN lets you spoof your location so you can appear like you're in, say, Taiwan and purchase your account for just over two bucks a month. Now, I live in the Chicago area and I travel a whole lot and I can't always watch the Cherries when they're playing live uh, or for that matter, the championship where I'm, I'm following Hall City to see if they can finally get over the hump and get into the Premier League themselves. So what I do is I use ExpressVPN to stream. ExpressVPN comes with apps for computers and mobile devices and digital media, media players, he says, like Fire TV. And of course, and especially, you can use ExpressVPN every time you go online to keep all of your network data encrypted, secure, and safe from hackers. That's what VPNs are all about, for God's sakes. And ExpressVPN is the fastest one that I've tried, and it costs less than six bucks a month as well as comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So you can enjoy all the fun that the English Premier League has to offer with the world's most trusted VPN, ExpressVPN. And of course, we've got a special offer for our listeners so you can protect your online activity and as well, find out as you how you can get three free months at expressvpn.com slash goodseats. That's ExpressVPN. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V as in Victor, P-N dot com 
slash good seats, and you're going to get three free months with a one year package. Again, visit expressvpn.com slash good seats to learn more. And now back to our conversation. Let's talk about some of some of the play and and some of your some some of your experiences playing right because a lot of these teams were and I'm sure this wasn't the original plan but a lot of the once the league got going in 75 and 76 it was largely a southwestern almost regional kind of footprint in terms of franchises what was the experience how, how were you taken to in San Diego by the fans by the press uh, what was the quality of play was it worth your time so to speak I I got a sense that some of this or maybe a lot of this was kind of a lot of fun looked like it well, it was a lot of, it was a lot of fun once we realized the women were going to be able to do the to create a product that was they weren't going to hamper us i mean we were really very concerned about that initially as players you're giving up your olympic your amateur status to play on this league and then you're hoping it's going to make it uh, and we didn't know what the product if the women were going to be able to perform at a high enough level but that they did, and they surprised everybody in a good way, as far as the players. Where were we at? What was the question again? Well, uh, you're, how, you know, what was it like in the sports arena when you're traveling? Okay, to play, you know that kind of stuff. The fans. No, it was great. We usually our team was one of the. I started off that first year in San Diego, and and Wilt was playing all the games for the LA team and. The league was Santa Barbara, San Diego, L.A., a lot of volleyball fans in uh, Salt Lake in um, where was it in Juarez or what it was El Paso. They had a good following. So we had we usually drew between twenty five hundred and five thousand. If Wilk played in the San Diego sports arena, we'd have six or seven thousand people. So we were doing pretty well. I, mean, I think I think we were on on this program for where they expected us to be and where they hoped us to be. And um, owners were with Wolper, with Barry Gordy, with Wilt in the program. Owners were kind of going, "Oh, this is interesting." And uh, you know, we had in Santa Barbara, they had uh, Schlumberger. Um, she was involved with it. She was dating one of the volleyball players and, and that's a pretty, it was Rothschild. She was a Rothschild and a Schlumberger. So it doesn't get bigger than that. She was helping finance the Santa Barbara team. Um, so we had some good things going for us and the volleyball was great. We had the critical thing is we had the best setters in the world playing. And we were by far better than our U S national team. All the best players quit the national team because they weren't going to the U S the limp. They weren't, we were boycotting the 80 Olympics. So we knew that a couple, a year and a half in advance or a year in advance. So everybody joined this league and we had the best uh, foreign players in the world playing here too. So we had, we didn't want all foreign players, but each team wanted, each team had one or two or maybe three players from a foreign country. So the play, and they were, the best players in the world. So we, as Americans, we were trailing behind, but we quickly got up to that speed because you're playing with the best guys in the world on your team and against you. So, you know, our athleticism was just as good. We just didn't have the experience at that level. But once those guys started mixing in with us, the level of play really got really high. So we, we were the only league, only place to play in the world where you could make money. So we had a lot of the very premier guys that were just getting older and ready to retire. They wanted to play in our league. So we had a lot of Polish, Yugoslav and Romanian guys, Brazilian guys, Japanese guys. We had a lot of international players. So it was really exciting in that regard because we were playing with and against the heroes that we, I was just out of college. So these guys were, like 30, 31, just off winning the world championships. And suddenly I get to play with them or against them. It was pretty thrilling. So that was really exciting. And then you just playing in front of crowds in Santa Barbara, 
I did college. It was Santa Barbara was always sold out. Tucson was always sold out, and Denver usually had four or five thousand people. So there were there were quite a few venues that were doing well, you know, with the with the uh, fans and stuff. But still, it wasn't big enough yet where the owners weren't having to fork out principal money. And how about how about the dynamic amongst the players, right? So it's you're describing a mix of international of. Uh, uh, women largely from sort of the indoor kind of thing and 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 their uh, unique uh, skill sets and or uh, shall we say uh, attractiveness and a little bit of the beach volleyball culture in the mix um sounds like a a um, an interesting recipe uh player wise it seems though also that the camaraderie was pretty strong and it was almost sort of like a a, a shared uh, love of the experience and and experience maybe with Captain Lee yeah, other than the foreign players, we all knew each other. We were all friends from years, you know, whether like Rudy was my coach, I knew him, but the other older guys were on the guys you idolized, but we knew them from either the beach or from indoor volleyball or from whatever. So the Americans all knew each other and, you know, either hated each other from past issues with playing against each other or, but we all loved each other too. The international guys, you know, they, they, uh, some of them didn't speak the language. We had to like, you know, kind of use the sign language. It'd be like a Tani for the angels coming over, you know, only we didn't have a interpreter. They had to fit in and they had to like learn English a little bit. And, but it was, it was pretty funny that one of our, in Santa Barbara, one of our Mexican guys, he was really a funny guy. He, he comes up and he's like halfway through the season and he goes, he like goes, God damn it! I've been here three months, and you already none of you know how to speak Spanish yet. You know, <laughs> he's like expecting us to learn Spanish for him. How about also the cities and stuff too? Did that have anything to do? I mean, you know, you're playing in. Yeah, you, know, you guys were in in the major arena there in San Diego, sharing time with. Uh, well, I guess it was the the, the ABA Conquistadors, and then the uh, the San Diego Clippers on the basketball side. That's a major arena versus say. I'm going to guess El Paso Juarez or Tucson was not necessarily, were not necessarily the, uh, the highest order of facilities. No, no, no. Tucson was a, it was like a 3000 seat high school, Santa Barbara. We played at Santa Barbara city college, which is about 3000 also. So that was the typical venue Phoenix. See, I played in San Diego. I played in Phoenix. I played in Santa Barbara. I played in Tucson. So I've, I've played a, on a lot of different teams. So, uh, but Denver had a big arena. Salt Lake City had a big arena. Um, San Diego played in a big arena. So there were three arenas that would seat like 12,000 people, but, uh, you know, we didn't ever fill up 12,000, I don't think. Then, of course, we played, we had the all-star game and we played the Houston Rockets basketball team. I don't know if you knew that. No. It was pretty. Oh yeah, we played. It was Calvin Murphy was out there. We, I think Moses Malone might have been. Out. Yeah, we played. Wilt was playing on our team, and somehow I don't know if he arranged or somebody, but we went to Houston and we played the Houston Rockets. <laughs> they didn't know, but anything about volleyball, they were volleyball? serving. A, Do you play them in volleyball? Or play in volleyball. Basketball? Oh, okay. In volleyball. In volleyball. And it was like a fun jokester kind of thing, but it was it was pretty weird. It was really funny. Well, what happened? I mean, did they did they hold like, their own, or was it just kind of a farce? No, it was like a little farcical thing that we did. I I think it might have been a little prelim to the All Star game that we had, or something. But they came out there and were hitting the ball around. I can't really remember exactly how that happened, but I don't even know if the whole team was there. Or if it, but I know like several of the top players were out there and jumping around doing, trying to do stuff. It was pretty fun. It might've been the prelude to, to the, the 76. Uh, well, I know that all-star game, I think in 76, I think maybe one of the championship matches was on CBS or something. And, and of course YouTube does not have it. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a sort of our little, no, there was, the, no, there was a, there, I think it was an all-star game someplace in Houston or someplace. And we, they were trying to get a, franchise there maybe or something so they put the all-star and Wilt was there and I and I can't really remember if the if they for, if they 
if they had a full team come out or if like three or four players came out, I can't really remember, you know, so long ago, but I remember going, what the hell? There's these basketball guys. What are they doing? So it was pretty funny. Well, let, let's talk about somebody Wilt. might somebody will remember. Yeah, well, let's talk about Wilt though, because you you alluded to earlier that that basketball and volleyball tend to be kind of uh, you know uh, intertwined sometimes in terms of play. I know Bill Walton, for example, thought volleyball is a kind of a helpful sort of rec- recuperative kind of activity for all of his uh, issues. But but Wilt obviously was an outsized, <laughs> literally and figuratively, uh, figure in all of this. What of Wilt? Why this curious uh, uh, in- interest in volleyball from his perspective? And 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 uh, how, how good of a player was here's how Here's how it worked. Wilt tore his Achilles tendon for the Lakers. So he was he rehabbed it, and the the near the end of his rehab, he was supposed to run soft sand down at the beach. So we're playing beach volleyball down in Santa Monica, and of course, you can spot Wilt a mile away. You know, he's a seven foot black guy at the beach. He's like he, just gigantic. So we see Wilt down at the just above the water in the soft sand jogging every day. And every day he's like looking up and, you know, there's these beautiful blonde girls playing beach volleyball. So every day he's doing it every day, jogging in the soft sand. Every day he's a little closer, a little closer. And finally he's right up at the court telling everybody how to play and what's wrong with why they're shitty. And if he was playing it, you should do it like, you know, this, he was like, no matter what, if it was playing cards, if it was playing chess, if it was playing anything, he was the expert right away because that's the way he was i mean he was just in a joking sort of way but really really also i mean that's just the way he was but anyway so he ended up ingratiating himself into the the group and the next thing you know he's dating the girls down there every day he's down there he's he's learning to play volleyball because he loves to play mixed with the cutest girls so he's always playing with them and uh that's how he became involved in volleyball he just he loved the the lifestyle and then when he retired from the lakers every day that he almost every day he was at the beach at muscle beach playing beach volleyball and having his he ended up with a full on entourage down there of people that you know would he, that became he became involved in the whole social group that i was talking about of this beach volleyball culture for about 10 years of his life he that was it. He was there. He would go to the tournaments and watch. He even played in one tournament. They scheduled him the first round. It was he played with one guy, and then they 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 you know they I told you they had 120 team brackets, right? Well, they had Bill Walton and one guy playing, and they had Wilt Chamberlain and one guy playing, and they paired them against each other in the first round of the beach volleyball tournament. So it was pretty funny. But uh, so that's that's how he got involved. Yeah. So uh, obviously then. It, but he also became a very convenient, I guess, uh, marketing uh, uh, angle for the league as well. No. Well, what initially what happened, he started the, the money involved. He became he's he became friends with this guy, uh, Gene Selznick, really good friends. They become lifelong friends. And from going to the beach, Gene Selznick was one of the original superstars of beach volleyball. So he, and indoor volleyball, but he became really good friends with Gene Selznick. So Gene came up with this idea. You're such a marketing guy. We'll, we'll play four man. And so he rigged a team with Wilt, a Japanese guy and one other guy, and they would tour around the country and they would play collegiate teams four against six. And, you know, and Wilt would, this is when he was, this is when he was retired from the Lakers and they would travel around and they would play and they would sell out these three, 4,000 seat arena, you know, gyms or whatever. And they would play and they, the guys would make money and Wilt didn't really need the money, but his nature was he had to be paid the most, I'm sure. So anyway, he, that's how he got into actually playing on a, on a re- regular basis. And then when this, they approached him about the pro league, they're going, well, you already play in the, the four man thing. You're a natural. Yeah, we want you to be the figurehead and co-owner of the LA team with Wolper. So Wolper got, got 
wilt. And, uh, and that's how he got brought in. You know, he was in suddenly every time he would play, the, the tenants would triple. So they marketed him heavily. But that's how he got involved. Mainly it was a lot of cute girls and he's jogging by there and it seems really cool. He liked the whole scene. Um, there were a lot of basketball guys down there from UCLA that were playing volleyball. So he knew a couple of them and he just became a regular fixture down there. And then he started playing with Gene Selznick and then Wolper wanted to do this thing. So they of course approached him. And the next thing you know, he was in it. And then when he retired from that, he, along the same lines, he sponsored women's track because there, you know, a lot of beautiful women. So he sponsored a, a, a track team out of LA, but he was quite an, inter- he was an interesting character, a really nice guy. And, you know, just, he loved the whole scene. He became 10 years of his life. It was every day, all day long, playing cards, playing beach volleyball, going to the beach. Well, it's, and, uh, it sounds like he earned the respect, I guess, of the players, because I could imagine some of the players might not necessarily appreciate the, I don't know, the traveling sideshow or the, you know, the the distraction, I guess, of a, of a high wattage personality like him when they're there to play volleyball at a high level. Well, yeah, I mean, he he just imagine him. He picked up a sport. It really it, in at age 40 something, 42 or something. So. You know, it's not like he became proficient at all aspects of the game, but his size enabled him to to hit and block, you know, quite well. So you had when you when you played with him, you had to like compartmentalize what he was going to do for your team. You didn't want him trying to defend. You didn't want him trying to pass the ball. You know, it would be like you trying to pass a ping pong ball. You know, it's just so little in his hands and his arms and stuff. But when it came to hitting or blocking, he was so big and so and could jump so high and was so physically superior to everybody that his lack of technique was was not an issue. So you just wanted to use him just in the correct way. So you, you, any team he played on, you had to structure it so his you were only using him in his, in his strongest uh, areas, but he, he was a big personality, really fun. You know, he'd, he'd sleep on your couch, play car, come over, play cards, sleep on the couch. He didn't care. I mean, he, he loved to just hang out. You know, he, he felt very comfortable with the volleyball people. Wilt told me sometimes that when he played a basketball game, he would lose 10 pounds and sweat he would literally sweat out 10 pounds of weight. Well, when he was playing volleyball, he, there was a steady stream of sweat coming off his chin. I mean, he was just so big and so huge and he'd get worked up. Anyway, when you're at the net trying to block him, just picture, picture this, you jump up, he jumps up, he hits the ball and this sweat flies off his arm into your face. And it's like a big sponge just hitting you in the face every time he hits. I've got a picture of me and Rudy Sawara and we're trying to block him. And I, and right at the last moment I go, I'm not going to jump. And I just turn away because I know what's coming. It's the funniest thing because it's, it's a perfect picture of me going, ah, forget it. I'm not getting that. It's like literally wringing a sponge and throwing it in your face and it's all sweat. And it's just, ah, it was just the worst. Every, every play you got to whoop stop the game, run out, mop up the floor. Just like when you, these guys are shooting free throws in the NBA, after they run down the other side of the court, they, the guys with the mops run out there and mop up the floor and stuff. It's, but it was pretty fun. I'll, maybe I'll send you a picture to show you what, what that was like. It was, it's pretty funny. All right. Well, let me let me use that sort of as the as the uh, the pivot into and I don't want to be a, a wet blanket on this, but OK, you got Will Chamberlain, huge star power, great, great, great marketing uh, vehicle, yeah, most famous athlete in the world at that time. Right. You, you've got you've got high quality play, right? Uh, uh, the dynamic of, of co-ed with some, shall we say, not unattractive players uh, in the mix. Uh, you've got powerhouse media titans like Barry Diller and Barry Gordy and David Walper and, and you know, and some money behind it. And. It, it when does it st- it seems like that money by the way start to kind of leave 
relatively soon, maybe after a year or two of, of this uh, of this league. And when did you kind of so despite all of those seeming things going for it and you mentioned a couple of things, but when did you kind of start to sense that, you know, maybe this isn't going to last forever? Uh, any sort of evidence or or issues or, or just things that you saw during the quality of play or the ownership stability or instability? What, what uh, kind of gave you inklings that or were you just just having a good time and trying to keep it as going as long as possible? Yeah, we were having a good time keeping it going. But the big I think one of the big downfalls, I said, was the economy, but also Dodge Parker died. And Dodge was the big personality that that he was the pl- best, one of the best players, but he's also the big personality and he made things fun. And he, he, he was one of those guys who could talk these rich guys into, into owning teams. I think he personally kept the league alive the last couple of years of his life. Um, but by bringing in new owners and new blood and new finances and stuff, he was a big, big personality and he, and he made it fun. Um, and as long as the owners weren't losing too much money and they were having a lot of fun, which is what really kept the league going, um, things were good. But when they started losing a lot of money and just, it, it really, I think it was the economy and not having a TV outlet, you know, the, the, the big three is, is big a name as Wolper was or Diller or whatever, you know, they weren't going to finance the whole the whole league being put on NBC, you know, they'll show blurbs. They might show the all-star game for a segment, but it just wasn't going to happen. They had, we were competing with baseball, you know, I mean, in the summer and we're not going to, we're not going to, with, with ESPN, then we, we would have had a venue to show, showcase our events on TV. But the whole thing was, we were going to get the Olympic exposure. We were going to get, TV from that, and then we were we were hopefully going to get better exposure, but it never happened. The economy tanked. Dodge Parker died. So a couple of the franchises that were just the Orange County franchise just kind of folded when he dried up. He was player, coach, owner, and then he was also big in bringing the other guys in. And then when Denver had the drug thing go. All right. All right. Let's let, you good. can't just skip over that. Why we, we we dealt a little bit with this uh, in our uh, previous episode a couple of years ago. But but what was your take? And if you can explain for our audience what you mean by the brothers Casey and the Denver Comets, because uh, arguably it was the I don't want to call it the beginning of the end, but maybe the exclamation point of the end. Well, I played I played in a team in Phoenix and the owners there. Uh, brought in these two guys that were interested in starting a team in Denver. So they kind of apprenticed with the ownership and the team in Phoenix for a year. So I met those guys and I knew them really well. They they moved to Phoenix for the summer just to help with the front office and organizational stuff so that when they started their team in Denver the following year, they would kind of be up to speed. And they were the nicest, most dedicated guys to volleyball. They didn't do this just to, to mark. I don't, I don't believe to just as a marketing, I mean, just as a way to clean their money, they really loved volleyball. They were passionate about the team and they, I mean, you just don't create that and they loved the players and they loved the parties that were associated around the games and after the games. And they were, so when I was in Phoenix, I was playing for that team. They were there and we, I never had a hint of drug, anything related to drugs. I thought they were just some rich guys that were really passionate about volleyball. And I don't think any of the players really associated that I knew of that they were like some big cartel of drug guys. They loved volleyball and they were at every event and they were at every party and they were, they just loved the lifestyle, loved the whole thing. They, they wanted to get the best players. I mean, they were really wonderful guys. It, it wasn't like they were, you know, some Mexican cartel guys or something. They, they were the coolest, nicest guys. And we were all sh- shocked when that happened. You know, I mean, this is the late seventies. So there was a course, there was, 
you know, people doing players and front office people occasionally doing cocaine or smoking pot or whatever. That's just sort of what went along with that lifestyle back then. You know, all athletes were kind of partaking in that. You're young, you got a little money, you do this. But it wasn't like anybody thought there was like major dealing going on. And uh, when when they raided that arena with them at halftime, they're like right in the middle of the match. They go in and arrest the guys. I mean, these drug guys, they were, I mean, the DEA guys, they were just loving doing it. And, you know, it was, it's really kind of shameful. I mean, it, they, I guess they just wanted to fold the league and punish the whole league because of these guys, but you know, that was very damaging to the league. Well, we're talking, I think it was July 79 when that happened and, and they were charged with, uh, I guess a few with, uh, along with a few of the, the employees on the, on the team of, of basically running a, a multi-state operation, uh, both marijuana, I think also of cocaine and, and, I, you know, yeah, I mean, I guess you couldn't do it on a more, I guess, visible stage than in the, at halftime of a match. But, you know, I it I, so I guess the real question then is and I think I think you might have talked about this. I mean, why don't they go? Why don't they go in and, and lock up, uh, you know, Odell Beckham or somebody at halftime on the field or something? That'd be like at the NFL. Some guy beats his wife. Well, let's go arrest him at halftime on the NFL on national TV, you know? And it was really that was really a shitty thing to do. Yeah, I was to say if it's any consolation, I, I we've had some stories about the World Football League where there some 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 things happened during the courses of the game and stuff in terms of like locking up equipment and, and all that kind of stuff. So I this also could be part of the times of 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 the seventies and I guess the way sort of these things were sort of I guess addressed. But yeah, I mean it it could have been handled differently. But let me ask you this pointed question though: Do you you know I think. For those who have followed this story and, and have, have, have sort of understood what what the IVA was about and stuff, would you would you say, based on your recollections, that 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 was the 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 cause of maybe sort of the IVA ultimately going under, or do you think there was some some shakiness that, that no, I think it was I think it I think it was a culmination of events of the economy of Dodge Parker dying of the Denver thing, and just just not having a TV venue for the 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 events. And the and the Olympics we, not it, happening, which could have been the maybe the the yeah, lifeline, right? That could have been the the saving lifeline, you know, if we'd had the Olympic exposure, because we we could have we could have had a lot of exposure. It, and if we had gotten the exposure, I think the women playing would have been a big draw. There was there was a lot of female fans that came to the game, and the the women that were playing were like little superstars amongst the college and high school girl volleyball players, which you, you have to keep in mind, it's huge. It's bigger than any other sport for women, volleyball. It's the biggest by far. And, you know, we, we, that could have been a huge thing for us. And it was never really, it was never promoted enough or displayed enough because of the, the no, no TV exposure. All right, so let, let me ask you a couple of quick wrap up, wrap up questions then. So number one, what happened to you and and the other players sort of once all of this evaporated and went away? I know for you, you uh, went on to a, a pretty significant career, the AVP, this sort of professional league devoted to the sport of beach volleyball. But what happened not only for you, but also other players as this thing basically died a, a sad death in 1980? Well, there was the the international guys that were older. It was basically the end of their career. Some many of them went on to be national team coaches or club team coaches in back in Europe or Asia or whatever. Um, I was able to play in, in the AVP. There wasn't much money in it right then. And then when the when the Olympics allowed NBA players to play in the Olympics. Suddenly, everybody was it was wide open. If you'd played professional sports, you could then re reapply to play in the national team. So I played one year of AVP, and then I rejoined. I joined the U.S. national team because I, he, professionals could play. So I was young enough where I was, could still. And there was three or four other guys that went from the IVA back onto the national volleyball team. So we played in that, but then um, I got married, and before the '84 Olympics, I 
I uh, began playing it for money in Italy. Italy began having a lot of money. So Italy in the early 80s became the biggest paying location for volleyball. I mean, I think Karch Karai got over a million dollars a year playing in uh, Rimini. Well, and then in 84, obviously, and, and, and obviously uh, the, the incorporation of being... And that's what they... Yeah. 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 But, I mean, y- you look at what happened with the Olympics. The U.S. won the gold medal, and Karch Kirai finishes playing, and then suddenly he gets an offer for a million dollars a year playing in Italy. I mean, that's a pretty... You could see what the Olympics could do, you know? Suddenly he's world famous, and he's even famous in the United States just because and rightfully so, but because of his Olympic exploits. All right. Well, then on that track then, uh, you know, and I, we've kind of hinted at it before, it was ahead of its time and also conspired, I think, by, you know, a number of events like we've outlined here and you've mentioned, right, that, you know, it's kind of a, a, a witch's brew of, of unfortunate luck, I guess, uh, both macro and micro. If, yeah. if, if, you, if, you look, if you look at what happened once ESPN came in, skateboarding, snowmobiling, all this crazy stuff because they were, they created alternative sports that didn't even exist just to occupy their, their, their TV programming, you know, beach volleyball. We had MTV. We had all this stuff going on. If, if the AVP IVA could have made it to that period where they were, they needed programming. I think it would have, it would have survived. Because it was, it, it had a lot going for it. It just, ESPN was the key, the 24-hour sports network. You know, I mean, when you have, when you have women's softball and lacrosse being shown on primetime ESPN sports channels, I mean, come on. I don't think there's a huge audience for women's lacrosse. Well, so why then do you think Perhaps there hasn't been sort of a, a, a I know in the 80s there was Major League Volleyball for a little while and, and uh, but but nothing of, of maybe of a, a, as significant and maybe audacious uh, an attempt as the International Volleyball Association. Have there been attempts and or perhaps why not, uh, given now a, a media landscape that could support and nurture uh, what of professional team volleyball as a, as an opportunity or is is its time passed for some odd reason? Well, I think there's so much, there's so many, you know, low cost sporting events now that I think it it just missed its window. You know, the X games was not in existence. There was nothing. And that's a huge, that's a huge commitment where that's low cost, you know, it started off just with skateboarding and a ramp. I mean, come on. And now it's a huge thing all this big truck stuff. All, I mean, all this weird sports stuff that they put on these TV shows now. I mean, I think the, the cost to develop a league and start a league. I don't think, I don't think the motivation is there. I mean, we've got the Olympic volleyball and the beach volleyball is, is become huge. Like the number one, the quickest selling ticket in the Olympics is women's beach volleyball. It sells out the fastest. It's the most in demand ticket. It's, it's amazing. And, uh, that is kind of, I think the beach volleyball internationally and in the Olympics, has really, uh, taken over as far as the volleyball venue. So then how about the state of volleyball generally? I mean, I, do you think a co-ed volleyball circuit like, like the IVA could ever come back or do you think it's, Largely uh, uh, beach and and Olympics and it's kind of, yeah and collegiate. I think it's just I think it's going to be just beach and Olympics. In Europe and South America and Asia, there's club there's club volleyball which is huge and it's high paying, and that is a huge thing. It's just like soccer. Soccer is you have in in Europe and Asia and stuff. You have club teams. Each city has its own team. And it's a, it's a run by very wealthy people. It's half the time they're mafia type people. And like you, in Catania or Rome, you'll have a team and they play Milan. 
and that team is a professional team. And the way it, in the Italy, in Europe, the way it works, they have different levels of these teams. And like if you're in the top division, that's like the Dodgers. If you're in the second division, that's like Triple A baseball. If you're in the third division, that's like uh, a, a lower level. But you can go from the lower levels. If you win every year, you get promoted into a top and a higher tier. And you can there's issue, there's times when these intermediate teams suddenly win, 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 and suddenly they're playing against the equivalent of the Dodgers. It's really interesting in in Asia and Europe how that works. Just soccer, same thing. If you're the worst team in the top division in soccer, you get demoted the following year, and the best team in the lower division gets promoted. So it's club volleyball and club sports in Europe, Asia, South America. It's huge. It's huge, and they pay, you know, they pay million dollar contracts. Yeah, there's one thing we've learned in these conversations is I, you know, there's there's no, d- don't uh, don't put it past people to, to to maybe recognize that and think that perhaps the United States could be a, a, a fertile ground again for for something along these lines. Uh, you know, it's it's we see a lot of sort of history repeating itself as we get into all these old teams and leagues and stuff. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it's clearly. I mean, the, the sport of volleyball, regardless of where it's played, is, is it's a fascinating. It's fast paced. Uh, it's a team sport, and and there's certainly marketing capable elements to it all. And I can see why, you know, why why it was looked upon as maybe being a, a next big thing back in the '70s. I, you just wonder if there there could be a, another, you know, with some uh, stable management and some some marketing, uh, uh, you know, components to it that uh, it could somehow come back again in some way, shape, or form. But um, uh, it's interesting to hear you say that. Well, it's it's, it's, what happened. it's 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 got a lot of following as far as people that have played it. I mean, almost every one, so many women, if you go up and talk to women, you go, did you ever play volleyball in junior high or high school or whatever? Almost invariably at some level, they played it, you know, and you ask them the same about basketball or lacrosse or anything. No, but almost every girl, if she was somewhat athletic at all in school, they played volleyball. So you've got a huge, group of people that actually know the game and like the game and follow the game. And I think women's women's volleyball is on the rise. Like they have beach now collegiates or they're offering scholarships for women to play beach volleyball in high school. They have beach volleyball teams throughout the country. Now in college, same thing. They have female um, volleyball teams. Conversely, the men in college, because of college football taking up 50 scholarships, minor sports for men is very limited. They're not they're, They don't, they don't like to spend money on men because the college football programs take up so much money and so many scholarships, the more scholarships they award for these minor sports, they have to do the same for women. So uh, college, college football is a problem for all minor sports, water polo, volleyball, you know, all the minor sports, they, they struggle to survive because, you know, for every for every scholarship or you offer or every opportunity you offer the men because of title nine, you have to offer the women the same thing. So men's volleyball is, is in, in, in um, indoor Olympic style is seriously in, in difficulty. There's, I think there's only, I don't know how many men's teams there are, but San Diego State doesn't even have volleyball now, and that was one of the original hotbeds of all volleyball. And they don't they don't even offer team you now, San Diego State. So that is a big problem. All right, last question. If I could encapsulate maybe in a word of what I've heard today, and uh, it's almost when somebody says the IVA or or brings back memories, uh, good or bad, about the International Volleyball Association, and and you're it sounds a little bittersweet. I guess my question would be, can you give me a a, a, a comparison of the bitter versus the sweet? Well, I, I don't think it was bitter at all, other than I thought it was a, it had had a great chance to go and it was really fun. And it was, you know, it was, I thought it was really an amazing opportunity. Um, the interacting with the people that we, I was able to be with the, 
Wolpers and Barry Gordy, Will Chamberlain, and all that. It was like really exciting. You know, I, I was really lucky coming out of college. The second I graduated, there's a professional league. So I don't have to work. I'm going to play professional volleyball. Who thought that? And then, you know, so the IVA, I think, was offered a lot of us just a touch of what it'd be like to be a pro pro athlete and travel around and play in front of people. And, and so I don't have any bitterness at all. I thought it was the most fun time of my life, you know, traveling around playing sports for and able to support yourself. I thought, you know, it's, I was really lucky in so many ways. Um, I'm just a little disappointed at the culminating events didn't allow it to take off like we all hoped. But I think it was a great sport, and under the right circumstances, I think it could be again. In, like in Italy, it's on television all the time. All the major teams are playing; it's televised every every day, every game. So it's like it is happening. And in Japan, when we played there, I mean, the police had outside the arena where we played; they had to form lines elbow to elbow and back up to create a corridor so we can get on the bus. I mean, internationally in Brazil, they play in, they play in huge stadiums, um, volleyball. It's just, it just hasn't happened here, you know? So unfortunately, but, but other places in the world, it is happening. So maybe that'll be the venue for the next professional league. Um, and maybe some players can, like right now they go to they go to Italy they go to Greece they go to all different countries Japan Brazil so if you're good enough you play internationally that way that's where the professional the the American players that are good enough that's what they do now well i you know jay this has been really interesting i mean i i you know a lot of the the focus that we've obviously done uh, around these sports and leagues and stuff obviously has gravitated to the, the big 4 or big 5 uh, sports and and the IVA to me is is uh, an endless curiosity. I, I and I, I hope we do some more uh, conversations and episodes around it. I yeah, you know the the ama- the amazing thing is it was it, once again it wasn't we were playing professional sports, but we weren't making so much money that we didn't really focus on having fun, going to parties after the game, interacting, socializing with the owners. It was a it was a the owners. I think the main reason they stayed with it so long is they were having so much damn fun. I mean, the promotions, the crazy stuff going on, interacting with the players, you know, screaming and yelling and, and the, the owners, you know, were being interviewed by TV people. They're like, you know, they're wealthy guys, but they're real estate guys. And suddenly they're on the news being interviewed about their team. It was a lot of fun for them. They had a lot of fun in the Casey's. I mean, you, you know, Yes, whatever their drug connection was, primarily they were into the volleyball. I'm telling you, they loved it and they partied with us. And it wasn't like some drug party either. It was drinking beers after the game, talking about the game, going over to their place and at a pool party, you know, on your off day. It was really fun. And it wasn't like the owners became entrenched in in our lifestyle and us in their lifestyle. It was, it was, it was a really cool thing. And the, if you talk to the, some of the ex owners, like the Tucson people, if you could talk to those guys, they loved it. And they, they it was like tragic when it folded, they were like, they would have kept this thing going forever. They were having so much fun. So, you know, um, I wanted to say there might be an interesting guy for you to talk to and his name's John Lee. And he was a player, but he was also uh, involved with Jim Bartlett, who was one of the owners of the league and team. And he wrote for Volleyball Magazine. And he was a player. He was a journalist. He had, he had some interesting insights more from the owner's side, which might be interesting. And he's very articulate. And he might be really interesting for you to talk oh, to I, also. I love that connection. Yeah, because I know Jim Bartlett and, and Volleyball Magazine sort of kind of was part of the sort of the, I don't call it restructure, but sort of the, the locking down of the finance. Yeah, you know, try to keep it going. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jim Bartlett, here's an interesting little story. He got He was the first person to bring money into beach volleyball. 
and he used to go to the beach and he, everybody would talk about who was the best player, this and that. And he, there was one guy who said he was the best player. So he said, okay, I'll put money on up. I'll put like $2,000 up and we'll have a little tournament with you guys and we'll see who the best guy is. And so he personally put up the money and these two guys went at it down at uh, Muscle Beach playing one-on-one, if you can believe it. And uh, if you could reach out to Jim, I'd let Jim tell you the story, but it was pretty hilarious because no one had ever played for money, really. And he just said, okay, I'll put up the money. And then he thought, then he kind of just parlayed it and was occasionally doing that for interesting. He'd just think up, well, if you played with the girl and he played with the guy who had the war wound from Vietnam, who would win? And he would put up money for just the stupidest things, but it was all volleyball related. Here's a perfect example of Jim Bartlett. He's owning the team in Santa Barbara. And he comes up with one of the first promotional things. This is before people like in basketball would do halftime shots for $100,000 or something, right? He's like going, we got to get the fans involved in our halftime. So he comes up, he makes this character, this character, and he calls him Dr. Dig. And he puts him in like this wrestling outfit with a hood, you know, like he's World Wrestling Association, one of those Mexican wrestlers. He's in a cape and he's got a big silver suit on and he's got a hood on. And the thing was, you could win a TV if you could serve the ball and ace him. So he's on one side of the net and all these kids are lining up to serve. And if you can serve it and ace him without him touching the ball, you get a TV. Well, the funny thing is they put this spray paint on his tennis shoes so it would match his silver outfit, but they got the paint all over the bottom of the shoes. So he's standing out there and every time he goes to move, he falls down. So like in the first like eight serves, they give away three TVs because they spray painted his bottom of his shoes and he can't move. It's like the whole production just they just stopped it, you know, after three TVs. It was so funny because he's falling down literally every serve. These little kids are winning TVs right and left. I love this show. I'm telling you, these uh, interviews are fascinating to me. Uh, and uh, the more uh, seemingly obscure or hard to remember uh, for whatever reasons, uh, sports and leagues and all that kind of stuff, uh, uh, teams. It just fascinates me endlessly. And I appreciate to no end uh, Jay Hanseth for uh, digging up some of the uh, the fond memories and maybe not so fond, <laughs> I think, uh, of the International Volleyball Association. What a what a league. I mean, you know, um, if you grew up in the Southwest or even the West Coast, you, you may remember it. But frankly, you may also remember it if you uh, were diligently watching, you know, things like the Superstars on ABC, uh, you know, two of the uh, uh, well-performing uh, women uh, in that competition over the years played in the IVA. Linda Fernandez, for one, and Mary Jo Pepler uh, being another. And um, strangely, their uh, their performances on that, uh, that iconic show did not translate uh, into a more mainstream uh, success on television for the International Volleyball Association. Something, by the way, we uh, talked about with our uh, our pal Kyle Rowe Jr., who was uh, almost dominant in the Superstars with the old North American Soccer League. Uh, that was a little bit more exposure for the league and for him then, but um, still nothing uh, of significance when it came to national television coverage until way later, uh, and even after uh, Kyle was uh, retired as a player. Uh, for that matter. Um, even more astonishing is David Walper, who is, you know, an extraordinary, uh, prolific and well-regarded television producer uh, of his day, you know, uh, roots and, and and far more than just that uh, in the, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. Uh, you know, this is a guy with the sort of Midas touch when it comes to television production. Even he couldn't figure out a way uh, to get the uh, IVA into a more national uh, television uh, you know, contract situation. Uh, There were, if you remember, maybe some CBS Sports Spectaculars along the way. Uh, There was, I think, at least an all-star game and uh, maybe even a playoff game of the IVA that uh, that made uh, that uh, those episodes. But, you know, that was uh, about it when it came to national 
television coverage of the IVA. I mean, people like Will Chamberlain, for God's sakes, you know, couldn't even uh, uh, attract uh, a national uh, a television uh, a scenario. You get people like Barry Gordy and and uh, and Barry Diller. I mean, these are all people, major, major figures in the entertainment world, and they still couldn't make it work for whatever reasons. But it, you cannot deny the passion uh, and the skill of the players that played and frankly the sheer fun it seems that uh the iva uh provided and again of course it was during the 70s for god's sakes but uh boy oh boy if you were in tucson or in uh, uh el paso juarez or santa barbara or la or you know all this a bunch of those southwestern or even western con- uh, countries cities uh, where the iva played uh, their games uh, i'm sure you might remember uh some uh some amazing uh, matches and some fun times and uh, we appreciate jay uh, for recollecting just a bit about some of those and, and remembering uh, this league and hopefully we'll some more stories uh, to come uh, for you and from the IVA uh, as uh, as we keep marching along in our merry little way in these uh, great episodes as we uh, keep unfolding more and more stories from the world of uh, forgotten sports. And uh, we thank you for, of course, listening. But uh, by all means, by check out all of our old episodes, why don't you? If you enjoyed this one, you're certainly going to enjoy episode number nine, uh, our episode with uh, with Mike Jacobs, who was the uh, producer and director and writer and creator of that ESPN 30 for 30 documentary called Bump and Spike. We'll have a link to uh, the promo and where you can watch that movie or find it uh, on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. And again, you're going to find the dozens and dozens of other episodes from all kinds of leagues and teams, not just the International Volleyball Association, but you name the league and teams and sports. We're, we're on our way to tackling as many of them as we can. And uh, that's where you can listen to all those episodes and download them, do what you want. You can also find our social links there. Uh, we're on Twitter at Good Seats Still. You'll find us on uh, Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, you'll find us on Facebook. we got a page devoted to us there. Uh, let's see. On the website, you can find a link to send us some email if you'd like, uh, or you can do that directly at hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. And on the website, you'll find a link to our weekly newsletter. We'll you find out uh, before the uh, average Joe on the street uh, what we're going to be uh, featuring uh, in each upcoming week's episode Uh, so you don't miss a thing. And uh, last, but of course, not least, our friends at Podfly Productions are worth your time. Our pal Jerry Payne in particular, he's our producer and puts all our pieces together. We appreciate his efforts each and every week, despite his disdain maybe for the process and our little idiosyncrasies and and how we record all this. But uh, Jerry's been uh, super throughout the uh, the entire life of the show. And uh, Podfly Productions will, uh, will do you right if you're interested in getting into podcasting yourself. By all means, check them out at podfly.net. All right. I uh, thank you uh, immensely for listening uh, this week, and uh, we'll take care. Well, you'll take care, won't you? Sure you will. And uh, we'll see you next week. We'll listen to you. No, we're not going to listen to you. We're going to talk to you. That's it. We're going to bring you another fun-filled episode. Until then, we uh, wish you a fond adieu. And uh, until then, our ticket window is now closed. Take care. Bye-bye.